Welcome and thank you for joining today's conference, California ISO Media Briefing. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. All audio lines have been muted until the Q&A portion of the call. We will give you instructions on how to ask a question at that time. With that, I'll turn the call over to Steve Berberick, CEO and President. Steve? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll have a couple things to say here to give you a general overview of the system conditions as we see them right now and the likelihood of, um, of uh, load disruptions uh, later today. First, let me just give you a, a broad overview, and then, um, then I'll go into questions with you. In, and I'll let a couple people in the room introduce themselves real quick. Mark Rothiter, uh, Vice President of Market uh, Policy and Performance. John Phipps, Director of Real-Time Operations. Thank you. So for today, um, we have a forecast load of 50,528, which is higher than yesterday by about 1,000 megawatts. Yesterday's um, peak or, uh, forecast was 49,700, I think, somewhere in there. Um, we are currently pulling power usage today is running approximately 1,400 megawatts beyond our forecast and beyond what it was yesterday. Yesterday, we got load was um, increasing fairly dramatically until we got to 3 p.m. At 3 p.m. at about 45,000 megawatts load level, we had a dramatic flattening of the load curve like we've never seen before. And we believe it's all attributable to the great work that people did to conserve, to the many companies and corporations that took load off the system, um, and all the great cooperation that we had. We have a chart that is, should be on display right now. I want to just dramatize this. I used Friday, August 14th as an example of a load curve for this time of the year. It was a heavy load day, as you know, and we did have some load disruption on Friday afternoon or Friday evening. But note that that curve continued up at 3 o'clock, whereas the, lo the load chart on, on yesterday, the 17th, stopped growing at 3 o'clock, flattened out, and then declined. Also on that chart, you will see the Expect, you see the expected forecast, it's the stair step line on the chart. That's what we expected yesterday. The blue is actually what we saw. So the response, the reason why we did not have load disruption yesterday is very simply because the customers, the energy users, the, the companies, they all responded. We will need that today if we were, are to avoid load disruptions. Right now, given how we're tracking, we expect potential disruptions up to 2,700 megawatts uh, at approximately 7 o'clock tonight. Those can be avoided with the proper conservation efforts. So those are my opening comments, um, and we can open it up for questions then. As we move to Q&A, please press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your name, affiliation, and question. Once again, pressing pound two will indicate that you wish to ask a question. You have a few callers in line. And please state your name, affiliation, and question. Oh, hi, uh, this is Paul Rogers with the San Jose Mercury News. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, you talked a lot uh, just now about the uh, conservation successes. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, what kind of experience you had and are still having on the uh, generation side? Uh, have you been able to find more power within the state uh, and without the state, um, you know, from, from other places, from imports? Uh, if so, could you talk a little bit about where that's coming from? Uh, and then second, um, the president uh, just put out a statement. And he said, quote, in California, Democrats have intentionally implemented rolling blackouts, forcing Americans in the dark. Democrats are unable to keep up with energy demand. Meanwhile, I give America energy independence. In fact, so much we could never use it all. The Bernie Biden AOC Green New Deal plan 
would take California's failed policies to every American. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on those remarks. Thanks. Well, let me take the first part. First, um, as far as uh, additional generation, yes, we have found some additional generation, largely for cogeneration plants and on-site facilities. I would probably call it in the maybe a, a few hundred megawatts that are contributing to the system um, from around the state. As you know, the governor uh, made an executive order yesterday to allow them to run uh, backup generators and things like that. We are seeing that impact, um, and that's helpful. As far as imports go, I believe we are in a better situation today on imports than we were yesterday, and you can see that in the numbers. Yesterday, we told you that the, the maximum load interruption would be up to 4,400 megawatts. Today, it's 2,700 megawatts, the difference being almost entirely because of imports. Um, and where are they coming from? Uh, John, can I, or Mark, can I have one of you respond to that? Uh, primarily reduced exports. It's actually uh, the, but, uh, with the suspension of the convergence bidding, we did see the data market clear with uh, reduced exports out of California. Um, thanks, John. But we are seeing um, we are seeing a net increase in import um, on the system. So most of our power comes from Pacific Northwest. Maybe I could just give you a quick um, tutorial where it comes from. It comes from Pacific North, Northwest, over three 500,000 volt lines called the California Oregon Inter, uh, Interconnect. It is full, and as much as it can take, power is flowing south. There's also the Pacific DC Interconnect. It is also full. That flows power from the Pacific Northwest uh, down into Southern California and um, is very helpful today. We also get imports from the Southwest. Uh, the Southwest is hot, although it's cooled off a bit, and I think that um, contributes to some of the imports. Also, uh, the Northwest is able to wheel through the transmission systems in um, east of here, like in Nevada and Arizona, and get power to us from there if the transmission is available. That's, that's where it comes from. There's also wheel through and contractual rights that uh, go into other California balancing areas that come through us. Exactly right. And I think it's also important to tell everyone that the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power has brought on additional power units to help provide us any surplus power they have. And we are uh, deeply appreciative of that. So we're coordinating closely with them. I'll note their load is high today too. So we're going to make sure that uh, we uh, help each other as much as we can. Um, as it relates to the load sheds um, uh, the, or, the, or the load disruptions, um, those are actually um, issued by a shift manager down in our control room. And so uh, there wasn't any party affiliation um, or other kind of um, uh, input into the decision to shed load on Friday and Saturday night. Thank you. My caller, please state your name, affiliation, question, or comment. Hi, uh, Patrick Healy from NBC4 in Los Angeles. Thank you for taking my call. Um, the road disruptions Friday and Saturday were primarily in Northern California. Do you foresee, are you planning for the possibility of needing to shed load this afternoon, evening in Southern California? Thank you. Sure. Um, I would like to, though, uh, correct the Load shed was across the state on Friday and Saturday night. Maybe it was perceived to be more, and maybe they got more coverage in Northern California. But um, when we um, issue an order to shed load, like we did on Friday and Saturday night, it goes pro rata to all the utility distribution companies um, that are in our footprint. Um, so all of them got their share of the load shed. So Southern California Edison. Um, as an example, in San Diego, both um, received their share, 
In fact, um, a utility executive in uh, San Diego told me that she had been interrupted on um, Saturday night. And the plan for this afternoon, evening? Uh, right now, we show deficits um, up to 2,700 megawatts. The first deficit is um, uh, shows up around uh, four, and they go to about ten. But that's exactly what we saw yesterday. If we can get the same sort of response we got yesterday, we can minimize this um, or perhaps avoid it altogether. There, I mean, I, the, the operators downstairs in our control room told me that they had never seen a load chart like we saw yesterday. It was stunning, the conservation response that we got. And I applaud everyone who took actions to do that. And I know it's hot and I know it's hard, but those same actions today can make all the difference in the world. We just put a chart up that shows our deficiencies or our deficits expected today. Um, that should be available to you and you can kind of see how that flows across all the hours. Again, we had a chart very much like this yesterday that we were talking about yesterday, and we avoided all of that because of the fantastic conservation efforts. All right, we do have another question in queue here. Nicole, please state your name, affiliation, question, or comment. Yeah, hi, it's J.D. Morris from the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any update um, from the CPUC end of things. Um, have you guys been in touch with them um, since yesterday? They put out a statement um, basically saying that they're still looking into this and uh, they don't really understand why there wasn't um, enough power available because the demand is normal for August and the utilities um, should have uh, procured enough. So just wondering if you have a response to that. Yeah, let me take that in pieces. Yes, we are in communications uh, with the Public Utility Commission. I have been in frequent com uh, conversation with the President of the Public Utility Commission. We are joined at the hip in figuring out what happened and to do our best to create a plan to make sure it doesn't happen again. I would challenge the notion that this is normal summer heat. We haven't seen, or load, we haven't seen heat like this since 2006. And in fact, um, Death Valley had, I believe a day or two ago, had the highest recorded temperature on Earth I think it was, at 130 degrees, or maybe it's in the U.S., but um, I may have those facts wrong, but it is exceedingly hot. Um, a normal day load in the summer is about 38,000 megawatts. Um, what's, what's the highest load um, you guys have, have ever had, and is the reason that we can't meet it now um, you know, is that because, uh, I think you were saying yesterday, you know, that a lot of power plants have closed down since 2006 and we're more reliant on solar? Oh, we have confirmed that the death valley temperature was the highest ever on Earth, so uh, at least we checked that off. Um, what's the difference now? Um, there's a couple of things that are at play. Uh, but several things at play. The first is we do have less capacity here in California. A number of units have been retired um, since the 2006 heat wave. Um, and there's also less resources across the West because many of the large units in the West are have retired or are retiring as people move off of coal. So. Um, what we're seeing is less capacity in California, but more importantly, less capacity across the other, the rest of the region. The highest load we ever had was 50,270 on July 24th, 2006. I would note that we had 50,140 
something like that in 2017. The delta between what we had in 2017 and what we have today is we had probably four or 5,000 megawatts more imports that day to meet the load than we've had. And that's because at that time, the California, it was only hot in California. It wasn't exceedingly hot throughout the region. And that pretty much um, calls for why we're in the condition we're in. Okay, last question. Um, when do you expect things to get better? I was seeing today that um, temperatures might be uh, quite high next week as well. So, uh, but, but I think you guys only have a flex alert in place for today and tomorrow. You want to do that more? Yeah. Um, conditions tomorrow look like the uh, low levels are coming down uh, a slight bit and things are looking better for tomorrow. However, the low does start to uh, go back up uh, as a result of the temperatures going back up uh, starting as early as Thursday and uh, on through Friday into next week. So we don't have uh, complete accurate forecasts out uh, beyond the next couple of days. But uh, I think to your point, the temperatures are going to be increasing and we should expect that the loads will uh, go back up, but we will have a relief uh, hopefully tomorrow. And related to that, the, uh, the uh, what do I want to call the variable that will determine whether we have issues or not is whether the rest of the West is hot um, as well. We do have a few more questions in the queue. Call it, please state your name, affiliation, and question or comment. Uh, hi, this is uh, James Downing of Pomerx today. Um, I know you talked a lot about the PUC, but is there any changes that the ISO could make in its rules to incent uh, generation performance? You know, I'm thinking ERCOT has a similar issues with big ramps and, and, and heat and stuff, but, you know, it has a much, uh, much higher scarcity pricing, for example, and it seems that bring their generation to bear pretty well. Um, is there anything like is, could that help in, in California? Well, I can't speak to what's going on in Texas right now, but um, I can tell you here, um, as far as the ISO, I, I think on Friday and Saturday night, well, first let me just tell, let, tell you this. We have every summer days that are difficult and tight, and our operations folks find ways whether through imports or other um, mechanisms at their hand, to make it work. And in my career here at the ISO, they have done it over and over and over again. And it happens all the time and every year. And on Friday and Saturday, we knew that it was going to be tight. And what we did not anticipate on Friday is how severe the impact was on imports until we got to that day. Um, and we were caught off guard. And we own not having identified that sooner so that we could have let people know sooner that they, there, was, there was a potential for a problem. On Saturday night, we were within, I'll say within an hour of being able to serve the load without incident. On Saturday night, right before the peak, we lost a 500 megawatt unit. Is that right, John, roughly? It's a 400 megawatt unit. And the wind had been very good, and then it ran out 1,000 megawatts right about the time that system went, that unit went offline, and we found ourselves in a deficit. I would add 30 minutes later, the wind returned the 1,000 megawatts, and we were able, and that's why the Saturday outage was so short. If the wind hadn't run out on us, um, we would have been okay. All right, we do have a few more questions in the queue. I just want to remind everyone to please state your name, affiliation, and then your question or comment. My call it, please go ahead. Um, this is 
This is Jeff Stanfield uh, with uh, uh, S&P Global. I just want to know uh, on the uh, today's outlook, it shows available capacity. Does that figure include the 6% operating reserve margin that uh, CAISA is required to maintain? Uh, or, or is that Yes, the reserve margin, let's say the outlook shows 50,000 megawatts of available capacity. The reserve margin would have to come out of that. Uh, okay, so so that's counting. So if the reserve margin was, say, 51, 52,000 megawatts, that uh, reserve margin, that includes the 6% operating reserve margin. That's correct. So you would take the 50,000 using the math uh, as we're using and you would deduct. What's the reserve margin? What's the operating margin, margin today? Uh, well, so the, but our operating reserve requirement roughly is 2,700 megawatts today. Yeah, so you would deduct 2,700 megawatts. I would also say that that number is not, it, there are outages on the system that's going to further reduce the number and the import variability is also going to change the number. We try to provide that number so that it's indicative, um, but it, we wish we could give you a more accurate number, but that's about the best we can give you. So I would caution everybody, if they see it's 50,000 megawatts and we're only going to peak at 48, why do we have a problem? Um, because the number moves around. It depends on imports, and you also have to take those reserves out. And, and if I might, speaking of reserves, We've had, I've seen some press that have talked about um, operating reserves, and I've seen some experts that have said that we should have just used our reserves. And I want to just talk about the role of reserves for a second. We, when reserves, reserves are kept to protect the system against contingencies, a loss of a big transmission line, loss of a big um, generating unit. And let me use Diablo Canyon as an example. One of those units is 1,100 megawatts, and we have to protect against that, and we have to protect against other contingencies on the system. If we did not do that, and the reserves were deployed to serve load, you would have nothing to protect against contingencies. And if you were at a zero operating reserve, when you lost one of those Santa Nofer units, you would crash the entire western grid. So that's what we're protecting against. So the experts, they're welcome to call our operators and talk through how it works, um, but I, I, would, I would caution uh, some of the baseless statements I've heard. I call it, please state your name, affiliation, and question. Hi, this is Nicola Groom from Reuters. Uh, I had a couple questions. First, I wonder if you could give a little bit more detail on the conservation efforts yesterday. Was it, uh, was, did it really come from large, uh, more industrial customers, or was it across the board? It was across the board, um, and let me tell you kind of behind the scenes what's been going on. Um, on probably starting Saturday, I've been in fairly constant contact with the Energy Commission as well as the Public Utility Commission, most importantly with the Governor's Office. And all of them have worked hand in hand to reach out to constituencies that they have relationships with to get load off the system starting at three o'clock. And some people in the governor's office have worked tirelessly to reach out to industry, to reach out to ports, to reach out to refineries, on and on to get load off the system at three o'clock for the next couple of days. It was a team effort, it included the Public Utility Commission and the Energy Commission and certainly the governor's office and uh, Anna Mata Santos and Alice Reynolds in the governor's office have worked tirelessly to uh, try to get load off the system. And 
I give all of that effort the credit for avoiding outages yesterday. Thank you. And then um, I was interested in what you said about um, the imports being affected by some of the coal, large coal plant retirements in the West. Um, are, are states not doing enough to come up with um, plans for replacing those units uh, once they go offline? And what, what more can, can we be doing to try to make sure that those are replaced with, uh, with other sources of generation? It, I think a lesson out of this is to better look at how we're backfilling for retiring, particularly thermal units like coal units and gas units for that matter. Um, there are, let me just say this, renewables have not caused this issue. This is a resource issue, not a renewable issue. And um, I, I think we need to be more thoughtful about what the grid looks like now because the grid looks very differently than it did 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we sweated through the peak at 430. Today, we worry about the load at 7 o'clock at night after the sun has gone down. And I think we need to be better collectively across the West and in California about thinking through how we serve all hours um, appropriately and, and effectively. And I'm sure when we're through this, we will be having conversations about how better to do that. If I could just add, this is Mark Roth, that every state does have a process called this integrated resource planning process that uh, really uh, attempts to plan the resource mix and the resources that are necessary to meet um, one's utilities load obligation or load expectations and any other obligations. Um, those, those resource plans are done on a state-by-state uh, -state or utility-by-utility -utility basis. Um, there is no coordinated regional uh, resource plan uh, process uh, across the interconnection in the West. Um, and everybody's doing their own resource plan for their sets of load and uh, obligations, but there's nothing across the region. Um, operator, I'm, I can take one more question, and then I have to go. I hope everybody appreciates the fact that we're kind of busy right now. Absolutely. I right, call it. Please state your name, affiliation, and question. Hi, this is Elizabeth McCarthy with Telesco in the Current. Thank you, Steve, Mark, and Jeff. I have three questions. One is how much. Um, what was the increase in the net imports? The other question is, what is the difference between the forecasted peak? First, it was 55 to 8 megawatts. Now online, it says 48, 856 megawatts. Is that one, the one I just said, the most accurate? And what's going on with the price in the day ahead um, market spikes, the price spikes? Um, I'll let Mark Rothier talk about uh, day ahead market prices. He'll have better insights into that. Um, I want to try to remember your questions. Um, uh, what were the first two parts imports. again? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, import. Import. It was at 58 yesterday, depending on what it was today. Yeah, it, it, we're we're running. It looks like about uh, 1,500 to 2 2,000 megawatts additional. Uh, import levels, so. Today versus yesterday. Yes. 1,500 to 2,000, What's that? 1,500 to 2,000? Yes. Okay. And the other one was, um, which is the best forecast peak to look at, the most recent one on your website? Well, the, the, web, the, the one on the website is the day ahead forecast from yesterday. The hour ahead is there, too. But we also show, if you look at the load curve, is the mm -hmm. hour ahead actually displayed? Yeah, the hour ahead will give you a more up-to-date um, forecast because we're constantly updating that. Right. So the hour ahead is the 48 uh, number. Yeah, the, the hour ahead is the forecast for the balance of the day, uh, and it's the most current forecast based on the most current uh, weather information. 
I am. This is John Phipps. Um, I am showing currently that though the hour head forecast is a 49,914. Um, so I'm not sure if maybe the web page hasn't been refreshed or not, but uh, that's currently what the hour head forecast is. Off of the today job. Okay. Um, in terms of the uh, you asked a question about the prices, uh, we are seeing high prices uh, approaching $1,000 at the system level across uh, the California system uh, during those high load hours. Uh, we expect that to potentially continue, um, and we expect that to also happen not just day ahead, but potentially in the real time as well. Um, it's not unusual to have high prices when you are at the uh, these levels of load and using the uh, last capacity in the system. Even though it's mostly in Southern California? Southern California, there's it was so you could have localized prices that are higher than that as a result of uh, transmission constraints, localized transmission constraints. And so uh, what I described as the thousand dollars, that's a system price. You can have locational prices reflective of um, transmission constraints into the local areas. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Oscar. Thank everybody for joining the call today. And that concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced. You may now disconnect.